<laughs> they did. All right, we um, we're okay. recording. I see we're live. All right, good morning. Uh, in the interest of getting everybody back to whatever they really want to be doing, uh, we might as well get started. Um, uh, this is the PSEP formal lecture portion for for May. Uh, we're going to talk uh, refresher on spinal trauma today and trauma packaging. And this is preparatory for next month's skill sessions, which will be on patient packaging. Um, spinal trauma has been uh, one of the issues that for EMS for years and years and years. Uh, uh, there's been lots of controversy about uh, how to appropriately package patients for trauma. Um, um, Mark and I wrote a paper uh, back in the 80s uh, about uh, using a algorithm to clear the C spine. This, uh, this was an algorithm that was being used in the uh, in emergency departments by emergency physicians, but had not been translated uh, officially to uh, use by paramedics and EMTs. And so we did a um, you'd have to call it research in those days, but uh, it was a very minimal research. It was just a retrospective review of uh, uh, outcomes of um, several hundred cases that uh, uh, that EMS in Clark County uh, managed to package using the um, or not package using the spinal clearance algorithm that uh, we had adopted from uh, basically from a manuals uh, trauma center to to uh, the field and uh, we published the paper which showed that the paramedics and EMTs were indeed able to evaluate people safely in the field using a spinal algorithm which is which we're still using a slightly modified variation of that today at any rate spinal trauma and if I can move this thing along here uh, doesn't want to respond to some of my stuff here. Where's my? There we go. Okay. Uh, just a review of the anatomy and physiology of the vertebral column. Uh, there are 33 bones all together in the human spine. Um, the basic function of the uh, is a skeletal support structure to uh, allow you to uh, uh, allow your body to hold together, if you will. It's the major portion of the axial skeleton, uh, protective container for the spinal cord. Uh, each vertebral body is a major weight bearing component, uh, say anterior, uh, and basically the vertebral body is uh, anterior to the other vertebral components. Now, um, I'm going to have to make this bigger so I can actually see this. I'm, not sure how I can do this. Nope. Uh, fiddle faddle. Hmm. Those are just pictures that all this stuff is on the that page. I know. At any rate, this is the this is the uh, uh, view of the. I'm trying to get this into the non presenter mode so I can actually make it bigger on my screen and I'm having difficulty doing that. Nope. Um, because this is all out of uh, out of focus for me. Uh, at any rate, this is the this is the uh, cervical, thoracic and uh, lumbar spine. Uh, typical the, the top two pictures are the uh, are C1 and C2. Um, or actually C1, and then the next picture is, I believe, C6 or 7. Um, you can see the, uh, you've got, uh, the interesting thing uh, that you'll notice is that the, the, the vertebral, the spinal, the space for the spinal cord, uh, is much, is largest in the, uh, cervical spine, uh, although the cervical spine is, 
C1 is actually smaller than perhaps L5. The, uh, the uh, spinal canal is much larger because there's an awful lot of uh, nerves going through there. As you, it, it, it stays relatively large down to about T1, and then from T1 on down, you've got no, you've got no more uh, nerves going to the uh, uh, to the arms and the diaphragm, and so all of your uh, uh, so your spinal cord becomes smaller at that level. Uh, it's got n nerves. It, it's got axons coming down to the legs at that level and going up uh, from the legs, but uh, it becomes quite a bit smaller. And then you get into the lumbar spaces and you've got a lot of nerves uh, arriving in the lumbar and sacral area. And so the spinal canal gets somewhat larger. <clears throat> Cervical spine has seven vertebrae. It is the sole support for the head. Well, a head usually weighs somewhere between 16 and 22 pounds. Relative in children, of course, the head is bigger and uh, relative to the size of their body and their basic mass, the head is uh, quite a bit heavier. And of course, the neck is somewhat weaker uh, in that age group. This is why we support children in in, uh, uh, in in child seats. C1, the atlas, supports the head. It is affixed to the occiput and allows nodding to occur uh, because you have some forward movement. So nodding is forward movement. C2, the axis, is uh, uh, provides a pivot joint, which is the odontoid process. It's also known as the hangman's bone, um, but uh, uh, the odontoid projects upward and allows the uh, axis to pivot on the on the axis so that your head can rotate and you can uh, basically nod no by going back and forth. C7 is normally the most prominent spinous process. So this is a picture of the the picture to the left is the uh, upper left is the uh, uh, atlas. Uh, there's the articular spaces for the occiput, very large uh, foramina. Uh, this is the odontoid, so this will be sitting on top of this, as in this picture, with the odontoid sticking up like a big thumb in the back, and there will be an odontoid axis of uh, or atlas uh, uh, ligament here, uh, but as you can see, uh, the, if this is distracted whoop, and moves forward, uh, the the odontoid process can impinge on. If it snaps forward, it can impinge upon the uh, spinal cord, which is in this position here. Now, you've got small transverse processes on the uh, cervical spine and that they articulate with the transverse process below articulates with the uh, with the transverse process above so that uh, it provides some stability for the neck and still allows the neck to turn sideways. Now these get arthritis and as you get older they get calcifications uh, and uh, this can cause uh, uh, neck pains and problems as we get older. Thoracic spine is 12 vertebra. First rib, interestingly enough, articulates with T1 and it also attaches to the, and, and so the first rib attaches to the transverse process and to the vertebral body. The next nine ribs attach to the inferior and superior portion of the adjacent vertebral bodies. Now, this allows, th this limits rib movement, but provides rigidity of the thoracic cage. Now, the fact that the first rib articulates with 
T1 transfers process and directly to the vertebral body means it's a really, it's a really, it's, it, it's the major stability there. This is to allow them and the, the muscle, the, your muscles attached, the, your, your intrathoracic muscles attached to the, the ribs and allow you and, and participate in elevating the ribs uh, because it's a fixed point at that at at T1 in the first rib it's a fixed point at that level so all the when when the when the uh, when the um, interrib muscles contract they uh, they elevate and open up the entire thorax so you can increase your volume of the of your lung of your of your chest which allows you to to improve respirations now the fact that t1 and the first rib are intimately attached uh, is one of the things we use if you fra if you have an injury that fractures your first rib we consider that 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 takes a major force to do that and so those rib, those injuries uh falls car wrecks whatever uh that fracture the first rib are highly associated with significant uh, intrathoracic injuries including disruptions of uh great vessels etc because there's so much force attached because that's a very stable stable uh condition now all your thoracic spine uh ver vertebral bodies are larger and stronger than the cervical spine and it's mostly it's mostly support to support the movement of your thoracic cage during normal respiration and forced respiration so here's your here, here's a typical thoracic vertebra and you see the rib is attaching here to this to this spot and also uh, at this spot so it's very very stable there's very very little movement of it. at that point the rib can be you can dislocate ribs from positions uh, uh, somewhat difficult but it certainly can be done lumbar spine has five vertebrae they bear the forces of bending and lifting above the pelvis. Largest and thickest vertebral bodies and intervertebral discs. Okay, I'm having a problem. Let's see. All right. So here is a, as you can see, these these vertebral bodies are extremely large. They're very, the spinous process and the transverse process are very heavy. Uh, they've got a lot of back musculature hooked to this, uh, and this is to st stabilize your your spine uh, uh, when you're doing lifting. You can see axial loading though can cause quite a bit of uh, disruption to the spine. Sacral spine normally has five fused vertebrae. There are a couple couple sacra that 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 have that the that the first sacral vertebra is not firmly fused uh, to the sacral spine, but that's that's unusual. So five fused vertebra, very solid thing, forms the posterior plate of the pelvis. And it's basically fused and and immobile or very slightly mobile to help protect uh, urinary and reproductive organs. There's some movement at the so-called sacroiliac joints, uh, um, uh, at least in younger persons, uh, uh, because the 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 joint at that point is basically a, a ligamentous type of uh, joint, and so there is some slight movement. So 
the sacrum attaches the pelvis and lower extremities to the rest of the axial skeleton. Now, this it still has uh, uh, foramina for the nerves uh, to come through, uh, come uh, to exit from the spinal cord and exit and exit through the uh, sacral um, uh, foramina. The coccyx has three to five fused vertebra. It probably is the residual element of a tail and uh, it does not have any nerves uh, and, and foramina coming out of it. Special consideration for pediatrics that uh, I mentioned already that infants have a large head to body uh, ratio. Uh, their head is as you know with the with the burn formula we give uh, about uh, we, we give much more uh, size to the to the to the infant's head <clears throat> than for than do in adults. The neck musculature is weak, so the head being heavy can be very mobile. Their discs, their inner vestibular discs, uh, have a very high water content, um, and uh, and they're not as strong, of course, as the as adults, but they're very mobile. Then uh, facets are horizontal and sh shallow, which means they don't provide as much stability uh, to the to the neck and head. They're normally their vertebral bodies are normally anterior wedge. So when you look at an X-ray, which of course. Paramedics are not looking at x-rays normally, but they they, they appear, the, the vertebrae appear to be uh, perhaps compressed anteriorly. They're not. That's the normal, that's the normal appearance. Uh, the uncinate process is the very top uh, uh, portion of the vertebral body itself that in in the adult has has developed a type of ridge. Uh, that allows that helps to stabilize the um, uh, the uh, vertebra when you when you do lateral movement and rotary movement, uh, and it, it, it's it's a, it helps to keep the um, the disc the di the intervertebral disc stable at that point. It's it's called uncinate because uncinate means uh, hook shaped. And it is has kind of a hook shape to it, which which is is a it's like a little cup, which helps to hold the the uh, vertebral body in place or the vertebral uh, intervertebral disc in place when you rotate your head or neck. Uh, the vertebral growth plate in a child is very brittle, so it can be injured very easily, especially with uh, uh, extreme flexion and extension movements. Now, one of the prime functions of the spinal column, of course, is to provide a uh, safe space for the uh, central nervous system to allow the uh, spinal cord and spinal nerves to be protected all the way down the um, spinal column. So in this, in the uh, spinal space, you have your, uh, spi your, your uh, spinal cord, which is an extension of the central nervous system. And just like the central nervous system, it is covered with the same layers uh, of protective and nutritive uh, uh, membranes that uh, that the brain has. So just like the brain, the outer layer, the part that's next to the bone of the uh, vertebra in the spinal space, is the dura mater. That's a fairly that's a fairly 
fairly firm, very, uh, I mean, fairly rigid, uh, very strong, protective uh, coating. The next layer in is the arachnoid. Arachnoid, for those of you who speak fluent Latin, arachnoid means spider, uh, and it's and, be, and it's called the arachnoid because it's a. Well, there we go. Uh, because it's a web-like structure, uh, it's uh, loosely attached to the dura, and it's full of collagen and connective tissues in a sort of a connective fiber is sort of like a web and then it's fluid filled. Um, basically it's, it's filled with cerebral spinal fluid uh, essentially and it's, uh, and it's a cushioning. It's a hyd hydrostatic cushioning for the spinal, co spinal cord just like it is in the brain. Now, because it's loosely attached to the dura, it can be separated. And so that's where, when it separates, you get a space, it's called the subdural space. And so that's what a subdural hematoma is, is bleeding into the space between the, um, be, between the dura and the, and the arachnoid. Now, the, part that's directly attached to or next to the uh, spinal cord itself is the uh, pia mater and that adheres generally very firmly to the spinal cord it's a thin layer um, and it's thought and it's 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 basically one one layer of cells thick and it's basically felt to be uh, impervious to fluid uh, so it provides part of the blood brain barrier if you will hmm. now we don't want to move Spinal cord is, of course, made of axons. Axons transmit signals either upward to the brain or down to the body. And there's a few there's a few tracks that actually have uh, axons that go both ways. Um, the ascending tracks transmit signals to the brain from the body. Everything from uh, from pain to uh, light touch, to position sense, to uh, uh, temperature sense. Um, and uh, so these are the sensory tracks. Uh, descending tracks uh, transmit are mostly motor tracks. They transmit signals to the body. So for both voluntary and fine muscle movement. Now your spinal nerves, Ordinarily, we say that there's one, one nerve for every, um, for every vertebra body, vertebral body, but that's not really true because there are eight cervical nerves, so C1 through C8, and they, and, and the reason that is, is that the first cervical uh, spinal nerve comes exit the spinal cord at the top of C1 and there's another one exiting at the bottom of C1 and then C8 then exits at the bottom cervical nerve, uh, of, of cervical vertebral body number seven and then T1 exits from the bottom of 
the first thoracic vertebra. So altogether, you end, you gain you you gain one cervical uh, uh, nerve. Now, cervical nerves come out basically and inter digitate with each other in in what are called spinal nerve plexuses. And in the cervical region, you've got a lot of action. C1 through C5 combine together outside of the spinal cord in the cervical plexus that becomes the phrenic nerve. And the phrenic nerve serves the diaphragm. And if you injure at, if you injure the spinal cord at somewhere uh, in the C, C1 to C5 level, you get some degree of respiratory paralysis. If you interrupt at C, C1, C2, then you get total respiratory paralysis. If you interrupt at C5, you get some partial respiratory paralysis and anything in between also. So you may not take out the entire phrenic nerve if you have a C3, C4, but you will be respiratory paresis at least. Now, the, the brachial plexus is composed of some elements of C5, serve a spinal nerve, a spinal nerve, and all the way through to T1. So C5 through T1, and that becomes after the, within the brachial plexus, these nerves interdigitate, and then they become the axillary nerve, the radial nerve, the median nerve, the musculocutaneous nerve, and the ulnar nerve, which all service the hands. Now that's a lot of nerves and a lot of different things doing the hand. That's and, and but of course, because we are uh, organisms that use <coughs> very fine movement and very and and opposite oppositional thumbs, so you can do things. This is this is how we're able to do this is because. You have a lot of uh, a lot of nerves, a lot of control from the brain that goes to your arms and particularly to your hands. Because there's a lot of nerves coming off there, then from that point on, you know, you've 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 gotten lots of nerves coming away to the to the upper digits, and so from that point on, the the rest of the spinal cord below C T one is smaller because you don't have those nerves anymore both the both the axons coming and going to the brain now the in the lumbar region so in the thoracic region you don't have you have nerve plexuses but but not under voluntary control they're under they're they're they help to control sympathetic uh things they help to control the gut Etc. But they're not. It's not voluntary control. You wait till you get to the lumbar area. T12 through L4 uh, form the lumbar plexus. They interdigitate and then they become the femoral and the obturator nerve. The femoral goes to the lower abdomen, the gluteus, the thighs. The obturator. Nerve goes to the abductor muscles and to in the medial thigh, and this is what allows your. Um, uh, this is what allows you to uh, move your upper. Your, move your thigh muscles and your gluteal muscles. The sacral plexus has L4 through. S3. That's this becomes the sciatic nerve that primarily services the lower extremity uh, uh, below the below the knee uh, and the lateral the lateral aspect of the thigh. Um, and if you you know obviously then if you injure any of these nerves in the plexus you have some 
in, inability to uh, to move your legs appropriately. Now, to get you know, sp spinal injuries are common. Um, uh, mechanisms include extremes of motion, hyperextension of the spine, uh, hyperflexion, uh, flexing your flexing your chin down and actually banging it to your chest, you know, an injury, a fall, uh, a diving injury, etc. Excessive rotation twisting of the cervical spine particularly or the thoracic or or the lumbar spine it's not you don't get too much rotation in the thoracic spine generally because of the stability of the thoracic cage uh, lateral bending when you get when you get uh, essentially uh, either left or right uh, injuries at axial load and axial load one side of the spine particularly um, uh, um, then you get compression fractures of the spine, which allows you to to which will produce a scoliosis essentially. Uh, axial stress means loading compression downward on the spine, and that's compression is common between T12 and L2. And the reason that happens is that T12 is 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 sta relatively stable because of the thoracic spine, but it so it doesn't allow much rot much flexion or movement. And so if you do downward compression, it's it's it, it doesn't have anywhere to go except onto the um, onto the vertebral body itself. Distraction occurs when uh, you get part of the body is the lower the lower portion of the body is held in one position and the upper and the upper uh, body can be pulled away pulled distracted and then you get a combination of injuries in particularly in motor vehicle accidents thing with distraction and ro and rotation or compression and flexion um, now other mechanism injury of course would be direct blunt or penetrating trauma uh, electrocution causes interesting uh, injuries often both because uh, as Dr. Gadbois case from case reviews last last month uh, was possibly a person who <coughs> who fell um, from a power pole after being uh, electrocuted but uh, 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 with electrocution you get extreme uh, muscle contraction which can actually physically uh, uh, injure spine by uh, compression injuries or direct uh, electrical conduction through the spinal cord. Now, uh, uh, this picture is quite obvious that uh, uh, the transection of a cord can occur when you uh, partially or completely sever the spinal cord. As you can see, the spinal cord would be going down, down those vertebrae, and obviously that has been totally disrupted. So uh, if you get, if you partially or completely sever the spinal cord, a complete spinal cord injury in the cervical spine will produce quadriplegia because all of the muscles of the upper and lower extremity have been now shut off from uh, from the brain. Um, you get incontinence because you've lost. You will have lo lose control of your bladder function because that has been cut off as well. And you will have respiratory paralysis depending on the on the level. I said if you have C1 through C3 involved, you've got complete respiratory paralysis because of the phrenic nerve. And if it's lower than that, you will have less respiratory paralysis. Below T1, if you get complete separation, of course, you have paraplegia. So the two, uh, two, the legs will be affected and you'll be incontinent because of the same reason. But you will not have respiratory paralysis. Now, an incomplete 
transection will cause varying degrees of paralysis or paresis, depending on where it is, of course. Uh, here's a cervical spine. This has been dislocated. This, of course, is the atlas. This is the axis. And of course, these two, this, this should belong over here. <laughs> So this is a this is person they're intubated, but we can tell that they're intubated because they will be completely paralyzed, uh, respiratory paralysis at that level. No. Incomplete transections. Uh, let's see, I, you know, there's a slide that I should have found here. Well. The anterior, this area in here, the posterior, the dorsal portion of the, uh, this is a slide of the, tra uh, of the uh, a trans, uh, transsectional side of the, uh, of the spinal cord. And the, these, these dorsal columns here are sensory columns. And they're the sensory columns for fine touch and for position sensation. Now, sensory columns for pain are down in this area here, uh, interestingly enough. And the sensory columns for pain um, are also, also do an interesting thing is that they enter the spinal cord and then they transition across to the other side and go these these go straight up and they they don't they don't separate so in an incomplete transsectional cord injury you can get what is called the anterior cord syndrome and and basically it occurs uh when the vascular supply to the anterior portion of the spinal cord is is severed and you end up with loss of motor function because the nerve the 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 motor neurons are in these lateral and anterior portions uh you you lose motor function and the sensation of pain and temperature below whatever site of injury so if it's at c7 you 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 would lose uh, pain and pain and sensation below the site of the below the T, C7, and you would lose motor function below C7. But you would re, but you will retain because the fine touch, positional, and vibration sensation comes in the these dorsal columns. You maintain that. Now, older persons, so people my age are are with, with cervical degenerative disease, if they have a hyperextension injury, so uh, falling backward or falling forward and and hitting their head and then hyperextending the cervical spine because they're, they're, you've got arthritis and you've got decrease in blood flow basically you can get a pinch of the central portion of the cord and if it occurs in the and it usually does occur in the cervical spine it occurs at the middle uh, you know at c4 c5 you will have motor weakness or semi paralysis and it affects the upper extremities to a greater extent because the nerves coming or going to the upper extremity are closer to the center and then they'll, they'll be exiting so they they get injured in the central cord syndrome whereas the lower extremities are further out and they will not be as much affected as you, you'll get some slight decrease 
of some paresis basically, but not a full paralysis. If the upper, if the arms are paralyzed, the 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 lower extremities may not be. So you, that's why it's 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 not, when you're examining people, and it, it's important not just to check whether they can move their lower extremities, but whether they have sensation and movement of their upper extremities as well, because which is why we ask you to check, you know, move, moving all four, et cetera. Also with the central cord syndrome, it's, it's, it's often common to get bladder dysfunction too. So some uh, either, either incontinence or bladder, um, uh, you know, uh, unable to empty your bladder. Now, brown saccard syndrome and interesting, it's a penetrating injury of the cord and remember, I, I I said that the that the pain and light touch uh, enters the spinal cord at the level of the cerv uh, of whatever cervical or thoracic uh, or uh, rather not thoracic but lumbar sacral area, and then it the pain sends it pain fibers cross over and go up. However, did I just lose this? No. No. Okay, well, it, it, lost, it lost it on my on my thing. I, I touched something and it disappeared. So I'm going to have to go. Okay, back to now. Can you still see that now? Yep. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so back to Brown Sicard. Uh, it's a penetrating injury, and because of the crossover, so you lose, uh, uh, you end up with same side of the injury, you lose the sensory. And motor sense mo and and motor control on that side, but they they will still have on that side they'll still have pain and temperature sensation, but they will lose, but they they lose it they lose pain and temperature from the other side of their body. So it's an odd thing. So the side that's paralyzed. It's still got pain and temperature there, but not, but it, but it won't have um, vibration sense. It won't have positional sense left. Only occurs though with, uh, uh, to my knowledge, only occurs with uh, penetrating injuries. So here is a thoracic spine with cord compression you can see you've got quite a bit of uh, uh, compression right here uh, from the vertebral bodies are compressed so hang on a sec cheesy um are you sharing your screen because i think you're on a different slide uh probably I'm, on slide 26. oh uh, let's see i'm uh, actually on slide 28. <laughs> Okay, um, hit the share button again. Make sure you're sharing your screen. You got to get up. I can't get up there. Uh, I'm going to have to 
close the. Are you seeing anything? Yeah, but the it's I can't tell because the frame is frozen. So you're. Well, I don't know what we've got going on here. And I don't have control of my uh, I can't I can't I can't. Make this thing smaller is the problem. All right, hang on just a minute. Yeah, I have lost control of this thing. <clears throat> Let me, I'm going to open it and I'll run it from my side. OK. But I don't, I, I'm not even sure I can get out of this now. Because I'm not, I'm, it, it's not responding to. I'm going to end this right here. Am I back now? Can you see my screen now? Um, Are you seeing my screen? No, not. Just uh, let me. I, I, I probably can, but let me just get down here and. Uh, I'm seeing the spinal trauma picture. OK, is that it? Yep. OK, well, we can do this. Unfortunately, we don't have all this stuff. I, I made some additions to the to the uh, last thing, but I'll just I'll just I'll just book it. The last two, three slides. OK. <laughs> all right, I guess so. That's the next one, right? OK. Yep. OK, spinal injury, so a uh, couple of things. Spinal shock, um, spinal shock is sometimes con uh, confused with um, um, what's called uh, spinal vascular shock. The spinal shock is a temporary insult to the cord, so it's a, could be a contusion, could be uh, um, uh, uh, a, a major compressive injury could be uh, any sort of any sort of injury to the cord, which uh, then uh, would essentially stun and es essentially paralyze the cord at that point for a while. Um, it affects the body below the level of the injury. The affected area is flaccid, so it doesn't have any. Uh, it doesn't have any motor control. Uh, it without feeling, no sensation. It'd be a paralysis, loss of movement. Frequently, bowel and bladder control is lost because, uh, especially if the if it's in the higher levels of the cord, uh, uh, priapism or uh, uncontrolled erection, uh, and Depending on where, once again, if you if you get a high spinal shock, then you could get you will get hypotension because uh, because it's secondary to vasodilatation. Now, <clears throat> one of the other issues to concern is that we we're talking primarily trauma here, so uh, uh, hemorrhage may be associated with the trauma too, which would also contribute to hypotension. 
Next slide. Now, neurogenic shock, also known as spinovascular shock, which is only confusing when you talk about spinal shock and spinal vascular shock. So neurogenic shock occurs when injury to the spinal cord disrupts, totally disrupts the spinal cord. So when you, so the spinal cord and it's permanently injured. The thing with spinal shock is it is temporary, but it may be, uh, uh, did a little research on it yesterday, spinal shock can occur <clears throat> for up to three to four months, <laughs> which is kind of a long time. Uh, so it, but neurogenic shock will it is essentially a permanent injury to the spinal cord, which then does the same thing. It, you lose uh, uh, you lose ability to control uh, muscles below that level, but as a, in addition, especially if it's in the cervical or thoracic area of injury, you get loss of sympathetic tone because you cut off the central nervous system's control of of uh, spinal vascular uh, uh, nerves which control the which help to control your uh, uh, you know cause vasoconstriction <clears throat> but also it stops your sympathetic control over the adrenal medulla which means that you cannot release epinephrine and norepinephrine from the medulla. So not only are the are the uh, are the vessels, blood vessels cut off from their basic sympathetic nerves, they're also cut off from epinephrine and norepinephrine from the adrenal medulla. And the net effect is, of course, you get dilatation of arteries and veins. So that expand so the vascular space becomes large. You get you get reduced in cardiac preload. So that gives you relative hypotension. If the patient has bled anything at that point, that makes it even more severe. And because you've decreased the cardiac preload, you reduce the strength of contraction of the muscles. Because the you know the Frank Starling reflex is necessary to give you that extra little push of the heart to to keep your blood pressure and your, your stroke volume adequate so and then the additional thing is you have because the parasympathetic system is not affected so the parasympathetic you know, the, the 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 vagus nerve your largest parasympathetic nerve is unimpeded by this thing because it is not supplied by these by the spinal cord uh, thing. This is the 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 vagus nerve is essentially a direct spinal uh, a direct central nervous system nerve. It's part of the it's part of the um, uh, uh, part of the nerves of your brain. And so, with the un unaffected parasympathetic system, you end up with uh, uh, very negative inotropic and chronotropic effects. So the patient is profound, can be profoundly hypotensive and bradycardic. And of course, that would be very, you know, a total reverse of what you'd expect if someone has it was a trauma, injured, bled out a little bit, and they and they need to have they need to have those uh, sympathetic stimulations to uh, as a protective mechanism next so signs and symptoms of neurogenic shock are bradycardia hypotension because they still have sympathetic nerves above the level of the injury they would be cool moist and pale they'd have all this sympathetic you know, their their vascular system can still contract above the level of the injury, but below the level of the injury, they'd be warm, dry, flush skin, and they're bradycardic and hypotensive. 
and if it male because you cut off the control of the uh, of the um, bladder and the and the uh, penis, they will often have priapism as well. Next. So there's a thing that uh, we it's mostly an emergency department term because uh, Skewara means uh, spinal cord injury without radiographic uh, abnormality. So obviously it implies you have to be able to take an X-ray or some sort of radiographic uh, uh, evaluation of the spine, and it, the spine looks normal, and and yet they have severe um, severe neurologic injury that's indicative of spinal cord injury. Um, generally occurs in younger people uh, under the age of eight. It's common from, uh, or not common, but it occurs with motor vehicle accidents, falls, child abuse. Above the level of eight occurs primarily in motor vehicle accidents or sports injuries, it's usually caused by hyperextension or hyperflexion, sometimes by distractions, sometimes by a, a pinching and actually infarcting the cord by by pinching the uh, uh, the vascular supply to the cord. Uh, the reason it's com more common in children is because they still have these uh, the their their spinal column is not fully matured, and so the disc spaces, the ligaments, etc., are very lax and very mo mobile, and their head is relatively bigger, etc. And so they end up with these severe injuries that look normal on x-ray. Uh, that wouldn't be necessarily a problem for for EMTs because you're going to evaluate the child. You don't have the advantage or disadvantage of taking an x-ray. Next. Uh, on to treatment basics. Uh, ABCs most important. Obviously, particularly if you know you have to address the ABCs to start with. Neurologic evaluation is uh, evaluate for paralysis, paresthesia, uh, loss of pain, anesthesia, uh, and a history of transient paresthesia or weakness. Um, uh, that may be from an initial spinal, minor spinal shock. Uh, that would still, if they give you a history that uh, that they that their hand was numb or that they were weak, uh, weak grip. It's like it's like a stroke. You you used to have to, even though it, they're getting better. Even though they may be getting better at the time you evaluate them uh, with that history, you need to uh, report that and to treat that as if it's a significant spinal injury. Then we do we're going to talk about spinal immobilization. Uh, uh, the, the basic term we should probably use is is spinal movement restriction or uh, spinal protection. <clears throat> Support the ABCs and susp always suspect injuries based on the mechanism on the mechanism of injury. Next, so do we long backboard or not? Well, this is this controversy has been going on a long time. Um, National Association of EMS uh, medical um, providers and the American College of Surgeons and Trauma Committee argued about this for a long time, but um, over the use of long backboard by EMS in the provision of spinal precaution, as, as those of you who have been in the system long enough know that uh, for years, uh, you know, at least since I've been in it for 45 years, we've required that with any kind of an accident, any kind of a mechanism injury, the patient got long backboarded for uh, no matter what. Next. <clears throat> now, this hasn't changed. The committee found that long the benefits of a long backboard are largely unproven, and they can cause problems such as pain, 
when laying on a back, I don't know if any of you have ever laid on a backboard for a long time, but it's not comfortable. Uh, and decreased tissue perfusion. So, they, so uh, especially with older people and with uh, uh, people who are either well padded or not well padded, or maybe uh, heavy when you lay in one position for a long time, you can get compression uh, injuries of the skin and and uh, subcutaneous tissues, including muscle. So, uh, and the longer you lay on one position, the worse it could be, and especially if you're immobile uh, because you're unconscious, um, that increases that risk. So, uh, the conclusion of the of the committee was that the use of a long backboard should be judicious and that the benefits should outweigh the risk of it. Next. <clears throat> so we have narrowed down the people who it makes sense to put a long backboard on or or who makes sense to have immobilization. Blunt trauma with altered level of consciousness because you can't adequately evaluate whether they really have an injury or not based on pain and tension, or if they have obvious spinal pain or spinal tenderness on evaluation, or if there is a neurologic complaint as part of this presentation, paralysis, weakness, um, uh, loss of sensation. If there's an anatomic spinal deformity, duh, well, that's an automatic. High injury, mechanism of injury, with any of the following, intoxication, drugs or alcohol, inability to communicate, either because you don't speak their language, so you can't determine whether they're really hurting someplace or whether they've got a complaint, uh, or they uh, cannot hear you, they're, they're uh, hearing impaired and they can't communicate, or their children and they can't communicate adequately, or they have a distracting injury. And that's one of the bugaboos of this thing is that what is a distracting injury? Well, really a distracting injury is anything that hurts, hurts and is taking your mind off, uh, off another area that might be hurt. You know, one of the, <laughs> Anyway, I, I was thinking of a, of a funny thing about distracting injuries, but uh, and some and depending on the person, your your ability to evaluate the scene, uh, sometimes a, a distracting injury may be relatively minor to to us. So you would say, well, gee, he's got a broken wrist, <clears throat> but I should. I should be able to evaluate whether they've got pain in their in their cervical or thoracic spine. But if the patient is uh, otherwise impaired, such as uh, maybe they're intoxicated or um, they're a special needs person, uh, that dis that the, a minor injury may be totally distracting to them. So. Distracting injuries, uh, uh, if you've got another injury present, I will always call that a distracting injury. Next. Now, immobilization on a long backboard is categorically not necessary if the GCS is 15, there's no spinal tenderness or deformity, there's no neural findings or complaints, there's no distracting injury and they have no intoxication. Now, how intoxicated do you have to be? Just intoxicated. You can't make a judgment, I mean, on that. Um, so if they're impaired by alcohol, alcohol or drugs, then they're, you know, uh, that you cannot, you cannot adequately evaluate. This is basically the, uh, the algorithm that we that we adopted long ago. Now, patient with penetrating trauma and no evidence of spinal injury should not be immobilized to a backboard, and they don't even need to have a cervical spine 
control at that point unless they have obvious evidence of spinal injury because when you put a cervical collar on a patient uh, you lose a, a lot of the ability to evaluate what's happening in their neck uh, with that penetrating trauma next Basically, the position statement of American College of Surgeons, NAMSP, and the uh, College of Surgeons is spinal precautions with C collar and immobilization to the gurney is the most appropriate thing for patients who are ambulatory at the scene, patients who required long transport, i.e. interfacility transport, or a patient where a long backboard is otherwise not indicated. But minimizing movement and attention to spinal precaution is still important. So you can immobilize people with the gurney. Next. Basically, in our system, all patients who meet trauma system activation criteria due to blunt trauma ha will have, at the minimum, an application of a cervical collar. If immobilization is impractical or not necessary and or leads to patient deterioration, apply a cervical collar and secure immobilize the person to the gurney, preferably in a supine position. Now, the only time you would alter the supine position is if it is if the patient did not do well in the supine position if it's for some reason this this affected their respirations etc next so when you're assessing a spinal injury patient rapid tra trauma assessment is, uh, is is focused well a rapid assessment um is different than the focused assessment uh, you should do the the brief focus to start with the rapid assessment is where you're going to then spend time looking at the likely for a likely or suspected spinal column injury so that would be in a multi-trauma system patient primarily evaluate for neck deformity pain crepitus warm tenderness bilateral extremities uh, check their fingers. Can they can they abduct their fingers and adduct their finger? Push, pull, grips. If you can do a quick neurologic uh, assessment and concentrate on the hands at that time, because um, if their fingers are weak, then their then their arms will be weak as uh, as well. Um, push pull grips, motor and sensory function, just pain, light touch. Um, if you have time, we check for dermatome and myotome in a, and, and basically you're uh, attaching the level of, of uh, anesthesia. So if they have a thoracic injury, they should have normal sensation and touch in the upper extremities. If they have a cervical uh, injury, they, they may be uh, loss of sensation below the nipple line, which is roughly at the T1 level. Uh, uh, in the field, that's one of the that's one of the least um, uh, you may not have time to do that. A Babinski test, as you know, is you you, you stroke the bottom of their uh, uh, of their foot, the plantar surface of their foot, uh, and the correct way is to. Well, you can't have it with their shoes on, of course, but hopefully you you've tested their 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 movement of ankle. You know whether they can push away with their toes and pull their toes up. That that's a quick way to test uh, nerves of the lower extremity. Uh, and uh, if you if you ha have their shoes off, we we stroke the bottom of the foot from the heel upward toward the big toe, and in a normal uh, Babinski, they will their their 
their toe will go up and separate in their toes in an abnormal Babinski, or a normal one will go down and an abnormal one it'll go up and separate. That's you have to have their shoes off, you have to be able to see their you know in their socks. You know, you're probably not going to do that. And I don't I wouldn't require that. Next. Vital signs, you'd want to get a sense, an idea of uh, body temperature above and below this site of injury. That could just be, you just fe they feel cold and sweaty um, uh, on their chest and their uh, and their neck, and they and they are are warm and uh, dry below, you know, in their in in their thighs and leg, and they've got. Uh, but they've got uh, bradycardia and hypotension. I'm going to call that um, 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 spinal injury at level uh, at somewhere in the thoracic or the low low thoracic, mid thoracic or low cervical area. Um, pulse, blood pressure, respirations, and then ongoing assessment. You know, with tra with trauma, we want to. Uh, we want as many vital signs you can, preferably every five minutes. I know that's sometimes difficult, so at least every 10 minutes, especially if they're now, if it's abnormal, certainly every five minutes. Next. Now, in moving the patient, uh, move the patient to a neutral inline position for transport and what's called a position of function, which the hips and knees should be slightly flexed for maximum comfort, uh, reduces stress on muscles and joints. So a rolled blanket under the knees would be good. Support the head and neck, cervical collar if it's a trauma entry, uh, secure them to either the gurney or to the, or to the, uh, or to a backboard, which is uncommon nowadays. Contraindications to the neutral position is if it, you're causing severe pain in moving or you have noticeable resistance during procedure. In all of the times uh, since I've been here, I, I think we've had two patients that had uh, distracting injuries of the cervical spine. They were they were basically uh, in a locked for all intents and purposes, they were in a a a, 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 torta, a locked torticollis. Their hit, their neck was twisted one because they had sort of they had they had locked their facets, the little side processes on their spinal uh, column, uh, and they that caused extreme resistance and extreme pain if anyone tried to so. Logically, they were transported in a position where you supported their head. Uh, that patient actually got that one I remember very well got transported on their side uh, with uh, 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 support under the neck and of the head to keep to keep it from uh, bending and uh, uh, that spine had to be essentially distracted and relocated after uh, uh, under anesthesia. Um, if you have increase in neurologic deficits during movement, then you're doing something wrong, of course, and a gross deformity of the spine. You 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 you're not going to move that around. Less movement is best. Ordinarily, most positions can most patients can go to the neutral inline position. Next. Now, we want to give a fluid challenge, particularly if you if you have any trauma patient who's shocky. Now, if they have neurogenic shock, you'll give um, uh, fluid challenge of 250 cc's and then repeat 250 and then repeat. You may have to do more. And if you think you if you have other signs of true neurogenic shock, such as hypotension, bradycardia, priapism, and um, 
perhaps some temperature changes uh, above and below the le level of suspected injury, uh, then you may you may well want to start uh, presser agents such as epinephrine drip or norepinephrine drip. Next. If your patient's combative, head injured and combative, and uh, you're worried about their cervical spine, uh, uh, consider sedatives, and the sedative of choice at that point would likely be midazolam, unless they were, uh, unless they were ex extremely hypotensive. And um, the trauma surgeons have often said that they would rather have you paralyze and intubate a uh, severely combative patient than, than <laughs> to try to take uh, uh, try to take a chance at injuring the, them injuring their spinal cord. You know, the, it has to be, you know, the, the situation has to warrant your decision at that point. Next. Patients for that are appropriate for full spinal immobilization, remember, are blunt trauma level with loss of uh, consciousness or altered level of consciousness, spinal pain or tendons, neurologic complaint, anatomic spinal deformity, intoxicated patient with high, high energy mechanism in, with intoxication, inability to communicate, or distracting injury. Next. So. Assess patient mentation. Do they have a decreased level of consciousness? Is there drug or alcohol ingestion? Is there loss of consciousness? Was there loss of consciousness involved? Yes or no. Next. Then subjectively, do they have cervical, thoracic, or lumbar spinal plane, pain? Either, either do they complain of it or do you find it when you evaluate them? Uh, do they have any numbness, tingling, burning, or weakness? And you can establish that. Next. Objectively, do they have cervical, thoracic, or lumbar deformity or tendinous? Do they have other severe distracting injury? Do they have pain with cervical range of motion? That's the very last thing in that. And of course, they have to be awake. They have to not have all those things such as intoxication, distracting injury, etc. If it's yes to any of the things that we just talked about, immobilize the patient. If it's no to all, they can treat you can treat and transport without full spinal immobilization. If they have penetrating neck injury without neurologic deficit, transport without spinal immobilization, including a cervical collar. Next. Modified spinal precautions, which are spinal precautions with C collar, immobilization of the gurney, if they were ambulatory at the scene, but they still have a reason to suspect they have an injury, <coughs> symptoms, long transport, interfacility transport, long backboard. Uh, you don't want to put them on a long backboard for one reason or another. However, minimize your motion and attention to spinal precautions. Once again, in our trauma system, anyone who has blunt, who has trauma system activation due to blunt trauma will have, at the minimum, a cervical collar immobilized to the gurney. Next. Okay, so our trauma guidelines include ground level falls. And ground level falls because of both cervical injury and uh, and thoracic injury and head injury after above age 55. Anyone taking anticoagulant medications is automatically entered into the trauma system that's a trauma system entry and anyone over age 55 with altered mental status is also entered into the trauma system now anticoagulants does not include 
daily aspirin. It includes super aspirins like uh, uh, Plavix, etc. It includes uh, any of your anticoagulants, and that's for the head injury cases. But we have a whole series of ground level falls, which are now called fall from standing height, and that have had cervical spinal injuries after above age 55. Next. Now, I'm going to talk briefly about key performance indicators. We'll get more later. You, uh, key performance indicators are um, established at the state level. Um, uh, they're, uh, they're things that we have decided um, uh, at the state level that that indicate a, a high highly performing uh, EMS systems. Um, it's it's basically data driven from data that is pulled from the charts. Um, and uh, there are a pro in in the state of Washington, there's uh, I believe 10 10 primary KPIs with multi uh, multi different sections below. Now, this this is this is a this is a performance indicator, which means it's not you you you're not at this time you're not necessarily penalized to uh, uh, for not meeting a key performance indicator, but you are, uh, but it's. It's felt that if you meet the key performance indicators, the system meets it, that they are functioning highly. And so we would be comparing the the idea is to compare a, a, a good functioning system with uh, one that is not as not functioning as well and is uh, and then. Uh, we could you could see how how the state could improve the. Uh, improve the system that is not doing as well by by either adding some uh, some some usually money and aids to it to to get equipment that they need or to get uh, or or to get some personnel trained differently but right now the the big bugaboo that everyone is having is getting appropriate data because everybody has different charts everybody has uh and so when we're reporting things to the state things are not uh always what they seem now the f the f we have a performance indicator for trauma and there's only two things in the in the state's KPI for trauma, and that basically has to do with scene time, because you know, with major trauma, we're we're concerned that the patient uh, that the patient is rapid rapidly packaged and taken to the trauma centers, which is where trauma is best treated, is in the trauma center and in, in, in by surgery. Um, now. Obviously, a, lar a large percentage of patients don't go to tr don't go to uh, traumas and or to major traumas. And the so the key performance indicated for trauma that that Clark County is being rated on already is 1.1, which is the percent of step one and step two trauma. I'll get to that in a second with an EMS scene time of less than 10 minutes, which is arrival to departure of the ambulance. Now, um, this argues this this thing doesn't doesn't um, take into consideration that sometimes uh, BLS arrives 
or non-transport arrives long before the ambulance arrives. Uh, but uh, and and the less than ten minute time is frankly something that nobody in the state is meeting right now. Number two uh, is and, and so uh, actually in Clark County we have adopted. 15 minutes as as our time period, and that will probably be done statewide. Um, point one point two is the percent of step one and step two trauma patients transported to a designated trauma center. Now I can tell you already that our numbers are very good for that because we only have one trauma center. So uh, uh, we're 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 scoring very well on that. We don't score as well on. Uh, the less than 10 minute time but with the 15 minute time we score pretty well. So what are you actually being tested on? Mark, go to the next slide. These are what the what step one and step two are by the Washington State Trauma Triage Destination Procedures. And you recognize all these because those are in your your trauma evaluations now when you're admitting and and we would use these step one and step two. These would be patients that in the old days we would say this is a full trauma alert. So you would call the trauma, you would call in or nowadays send in by Pulsera that you're entering a patient into the trauma system. The, the nurse will assign, the nurses now assign it because the, the for the hospital response, they assign what the levels are, but they're basically using step one and step two criteria too for, so all you have to remember is that those would be the major trauma entries. So a GCS of less than 13, systolic blood pressure at any time, less than 90, respiratory rate less than 10 or greater than 20. So those are the physiologic criteria. And then an anatomic criteria, step two, penetrating injuries, head, neck, torso, and extremities proximal to the elbow or knee, chest wall instability or deformity like a flail chest, two or more proximal long bone fractures, Crush, deglobe, mangled, pulsus, extremity, amputation, proximal to wrist or ankle, pelvic fractures, open or depressed skull fracture, and paralysis. So that would get you most of your spinal injuries and you know significant spinal injuries, et cetera, et cetera. And those are only the step one. The other, the step threes and fours are the softer criteria, mechanism injury criteria. <clears throat> you still enter them in the trauma system, but we will sort this out based, you know, based on um, on the other information you in. So if you enter the information that your patient is, is a trauma system entry and they have a GCS of less, less than 13, we'll automatically count that as a step one. Or if they're paralyzed, it'll be counted as a step two. Now, Mark and I are trying to come up with a way to make it simple for, for our system, which, you know, uh, because we have so many different, uh, we, have, we have several different um, uh, medical incident reports, uh, uh, electronic medical records that that it's a little difficult to come up with uh, uh, an automatic scanning of these things. But uh, we're trying to come up with whether we can go back to having you indicate to us whether this is if would have been a full trauma or a or a uh, or a. Uh, modified trauma entry and that way we would only count the full traumas into our um, rating system. Next. Now, uh, I want to briefly talk about KPIs for stroke because uh, we're doing, a, we, we, we are doing a major evaluation of stroke and our strokes are so far with the state information is not are not meeting the KPIs fully, uh, probably because of the the data is not. It's not easy to pull the data out because unless unless you put information into a into a uh, uh, a spot that can that the that the 
uh, computers can capture the data. The only other way I can get data is if is, is to review the um, uh, the narratives and the narratives. It's really hard to pull data out of narratives because you have to read everything and and find it in it. So we're gonna we're gonna send out a a list of what we what you need to put in your charts for stroke or TIA patient. Number one is the uh, we we look at the suspected the percent of of CVA TI patients suspected with a BFAST exam performed. Or documentation of why you couldn't do the exam, i.e. the patient's unconscious. Well, that still counts then if you're bringing them in, if you think they're unconscious because it's an intracerebral bleed or something like that. Obviously, you can't do a BFAST if the patient's unconscious. Additionally, and you see the little dot there, uh, you, you need to, do, if, you're, if your BFAST is positive, and it'd be nice if you tell me why the BFAST is positive. So if, if their balance is out, put down, you know, circle the BFAST or, or notate it that their balance is off so that we know exactly why the BFAST was positive. If the BFAST is positive, then you need to do a LAMS score, Los Angeles Motor Score, because that's, that determines which of the two hospitals the patient's going to go to. So if the, if the LAM score is above, and you have to put the number down, the LAM score is above four or four or above, then, you, then that patient can only go, that patient should only go to, to an interventional hospital, which is Peace Out Southwest. Number two, so this is actually three now, the percent of CVATI patients who got a blood glucose check, we, we're doing pretty well on that. We're able to find that because that, that's got a data point. You, put, you fill that in your, in your chart, you put it in and it's in the data section, not in the narrative. 6.3 is percent of CVATI patients with an EMS on scene time arrival to departure of ambulance of less than 20 minutes. We're doing fair on that, but we're missing some of that. So be careful, you know, that, that is a data point we're looking at. Ultimately, we'll, we'll audit your charts and, and ask you why, why, the, why you were on scene within 30 minutes, or if that's the case. And, may, and there may be good reason for it. It helps to document that in your narrative. <clears throat> Number fourth one. Uh, suspected CVITI patients with time last normal of less than six hours. Now, we've, for Clark County, we do a little bit, it's le we want less than 24 hours because we are taking people to intervention uh, in less than 24 hours. So we want their last normal time documented absolutely. Number five, the percent of patients transported to a designated stroke receiving center. Well, we do 100% on that because both, both hospitals are stroke receiving centers. That so makes it easy. But we then look at the LAM score to make sure that you took the patients to the right place. Now, we have a couple of other additions for Clark County that we, that we need you to be sure that you have in your charts, which is we want an EKG and we're willing to take a four lead or a 12 lead for that. So if you just have the, and, and why are we doing that? We want to know whether the patient is, has a, perhaps their stroke is due to a dysrhythmia like a fib. We want their SPO checked or a substitute for it is you gave O2 for the SATs less than 94. So that means that you've got O2 done. I personally would like a CO2, an SPO, SPCO2 done on all strokes, but we'll wait on that one. Uh, 
we look to see if there's an IO or an I, IV or IO placed or attempted. Um, and like I said, we also look for the appropriate hospital, but we'll sort that out. So those are the, now we will send you out a list uh, that you can use to cross check your charts, but be sure to put them in the data collection. Now for the transport people uh, who are transporting to Peace Health, um, much of this information needs to be also put into the Pulsera when you're doing a um, stroke alert. It needs to go into the Pulsera because they're going to be sending, especially things like the uh, like the lambs, uh, the BFAS, the lambs, etc., and the last known well, because that's going to be trans transmitted to the um, interventionalists uh, very quickly now. All right, I think that's the last slide. Let's see, I had a question that somebody asked. Uh, does this include all ground level falls with thinners? Yes. With real thinners. <laughs> OK. Any other questions? I'm sorry that we had uh, I had technical problems today. We're going to have to solve that one. Uh, I'm not sure why that didn't work well. It worked fine. The